you all for joining us. Today we're going to talk about uh, what is DevOps really and this is something of a personal view based on my own experience but this was a presentation that I put together for a client to try and give the the big context to this for them as they were battling with being down in the weeds and there was a lot of interest online about what it, what was in it so I thought why not share it with the world so that's the intent here let me start off by very quickly as you do introducing ourselves so I'm Rob England and it turns out that I know a large number of the people on this call and some of them from 30 years ago which is remarkable and joining me as co-host today is Dr. Cherry Vu. Hi, Cherry. Who's my, um, say hello to the people. Hello, I'm the boss. <laughs> she always, <laughs> Cherry's standard invitation introduction is, she's my <laughs> boss. Um, we are partners in life and work, and together we call ourselves Teal Unicorns. So we work in consulting in New Zealand and Vietnam, and uh, I've been consulting for 15 years and Cherry for a little longer. And uh, my thing has been IT service management, which is where I know a bunch of the people on this call from. Then in the last 10 years, increasingly it's been around DevOps, and now we work in the space of business agility. And, and Cherry's not an IT person, she works uh, at a business level, at an executive level in management. And I, so that's where I'm shifting to as well. So Cherry won't be contributing a great deal to the discussion on DevOps today, other than to wield the mute hammer for me. Um, if anybody forgets to mute their mic. But yeah, so we consult in both, well, we did obviously until COVID hit and we're still doing a lot of work remotely in Vietnam. Um, much of it around uh, training at the moment, but Cherry's also consulting and coaching there. And uh, I'm doing a bit of training online. I'm gearing to consult in Wellington now that we're back to level one and we're sort of all coming out from under our rocks in Wellington and the town is warming up again. And I'm doing some coaching as well. So uh, that's us. And I've been active in the DevOps community ever since. So um, some of you remember me as the IT skeptic, the blog that I retired at the end of last year, sadly. And the skeptic was skeptical about all things agile and DevOps from the very beginning. And, and um, I was talking to um, John Willis, especially, but also Gene and others right back in the early days. And so I was a mi minor contributor to the ITIL. 2011 service strategy book with David Cannon and an even more minor contributor to the high velocity IT book whose author is on the call with us today, Mark Smalley or lead author. Hi Mark. Uh, so I had a little bit to do with that. Uh, but so I have been involved in that ITIL world ever since, right back to ITIL version two and know a number of you from, from that world. Uh, I'm a, a lead author for Verizon, which is a digital service management framework out of the Netherlands. And um, I've got a small contribution again to the Phoenix Project, which I was a reviewer of, and the DevOps Handbook, which I contributed uh, some uh, stories to. Um, so, and, and the DevOps Enterprise Summit conference. So when I heard Gene was having a, a conference, um, I went to the first one and I went to all of them for, I think I went to seven in the end, I think seven or eight. And that was where I learned a lot about DevOps and, and brought that knowledge back to Wellington and tried to get people talking about DevOps in Wellington without success until about 2015, when suddenly everybody wanted to talk about DevOps and so I've been consulting in that space ever since. Uh, I'm one of the organizers of the Wellington DevOps Meetup group. Uh, I was one of the founders of the Business Agility Institute in Wellington and Cherry founded it in Vietnam. And I'm one of the early accredited trainers and DevOps for the DevOps Institute 
out of the US and still do training in that domain as well. So point is, been involved in that space ever since the start, uh, networking internationally, uh, making my small contribution to all that stuff around the space and, and still very active in it in Wellington. And so that's where I'm coming from. And so uh, I want to today just take us through a conceptual view of trying to give us the big picture view of DevOps and understand it at a higher context. Let's begin with uh, uh, some context, which you all know, it won't have escaped your attention that it's a volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous world at the moment. And the world is, is scrambling to adopt ways of working, which have been around for a while, but which are becoming more and more important uh, in this century and suddenly in this decade as well that's ramping up so there are new ways of working and that's an area of specialty for us now that's our domain as we talk about new ways of working and new ways of managing and these ideas as i say have been a decades old some of them are century old uh, but they're surfacing now and they're synthesizing and they're a movement and so people talk about new ways of working or they talk about agile which is massively overloading the word with asking it to cover a lot more than it was ever designed to. And so we stick to new ways of working mostly. When you look at the VUCA world and how people are trying to survive it, a, a, a little equation, if you like, or a combination that I see talked about quite a lot is that the necessary adaptability to deal with a volatile, rapidly changing and ambiguous world is adaptability and that adaptability is primarily agility and resilience so the ability to change quickly into experiments we'll talk about and the resilience to deal with the knocks and and the failures that are, that are inherent in that so adaptability is agility plus resilience is a, a basic axiom i think or a useful one for this so what is agility? The, um, we all know, but let us just remind ourselves that agility is a basic cycle, a cycle that we first do something, do an increment of work into some sort of product or output that we're producing. So incremental do, and then, and then observe from what we did, what the outcomes of that was. And then from that, we learn, we act upon what we observed, and we then review how we're working. We take time to pause and reflect, and that is our cycle that we go around and around. So we could characterize agility as the idea that we iterate, increment, experiment, and explore. And we take time always to, on each cycle to reflect and improve. So this, I think, is the basic pattern that characterizes agile, agility, and any way of working that looks to this pattern could be characterized as being an agile way of working. So I think a key point out of this is that the purpose of agile is speed to adapt, not speed of work. The purpose of agile is not to be fast. The purpose of agile is to quickly change how we work, to be able to have that adaptability. And so I love this quote that cheetahs are faster than gazelles, but less agile. So the hard time actually catching them. A cheetah can outrun a gazelle, but a gazelle can outturn a cheetah. And that's the balance that they maintain. So therefore, Velocity is the means, not the end. There's this sort of misconception out there that's very common that the purpose of agility is to be, of agile is to be fast. And it's not at all. The purpose of agile is to be able to change fast. Velocity is just the means to that end. Because if we are fast at how we work, then we can produce many small, short iterations. And that means that if we can quickly put out that small unit of work and cycle around quickly and reflect quickly, then we get many, option, many opportunities to adjust what we're doing. That reflect 
part of the cycle comes up often. So velocity is the means by which we accelerate that cycle so that we have many opportunities to adjust what we're doing. So tech debt is a primary drag on the ability of achieving that velocity. It slows us down in our ability to get to cycle. So one of the axioms that, one of the principles that you'll see called out a lot um, in things like Phoenix Project and the DevOps Handbook and all the stuff that Gene's associated with is that that velocity has to be achieved through quality. And that's a lean idea coming through to us that by increasing our quality, we reduce defects, which reduces rework, which allows us to work faster by having less unplanned work in the future. So velocity through quality is another, is a principle that allows us to try and address the technical debt issue. So velocity is just a means to agility. It's not the purpose of it. So how does one achieve velocity with higher quality? You can't do it with humans. You can't make humans work faster and work better. The, the two, when it's manual work, are in direct conflict with each other. So the way that we achieve velocity through quality is by automating. That's the tiebreaker that gets us out of that trap. And automation, to automate, we need defined repeatable work. That which can be automated is that which is defined and repeatable. And so some of you will be familiar with Kinefin from Dave Snowden, which is a sense-making tool for un understanding, situational understanding. And I'm not going to go through all of Kinefin today, but I urge you to learn more about it if you don't at Cognitive Edge. Kinefin talks about how there are these multiple domains that we can be in from chaotic and complex up to more defined, structured domains where we understand the causality, such as complicated, where we start, where it's knowable with some expertise, and clear, where it is known and familiar to us. If we look at that model of the world, we're constantly trying in IT, certainly, and in the context of when we're talking about DevOps, we're constantly trying to climb the ladder, if you like, of reducing entropy and getting to a more controlled work world where we can, where we can define and make the work repeatable. And so as we climb towards lower entropy and greater levels of constraint and control of what we're doing, we eventually get to this domain right up in the top right corner there where I've added an extra piece to the model. So this is my own 3D model of Kinefin. And there's a domain up there, which is the stuff we've actually managed to achieve to automate, which is the lowest entropy state we can get to. It, it's brittle, but it's, it's a low entropy state at the top. So the, the point of this is that it's hard work to get to something that's automatable. And there's only a small amount of our work or a certain amount of our work that will ever be or ever <laughs> AI, AI might change that one day, but for now, there's only a small amount of our work that can be automated. And so in order to achieve faster work with higher quality, in order to give us the agility to be adaptable, we try to move work to a point where we've got it sufficiently defined and repeatable that it's automatable and then automated. And the work that is automated is the work that we can do very, very fast at very, very high quality. And clearly, because this presentation is about DevOps, you can see where I'm going here, right? Most of you. That the real value of automation is not when I automate my job, but when I automate my job and make that automation available to somebody else. So the value of automation is in the sharing of automation. 
the val the real value to an organization of automation is when automation is provided as a service to others. So there's a progression we go on with work where we study it so that we can understand it and move it up that Kinefin entropy hill to a point where we've been able to standardize it to a point where we've made it defined and repeatable. And at that point, we can automate it. And once we've automated it, then it's essential we keep going to then provide it to others, to get it into a condition, idiot proof it and give it an interface and make it something that we can share as a tool. We become a tool maker and we share that automation to others. We provide it to others as a service. And that's when automation delivers its power and its value to an organization. And that means that other people can then leverage it. So if I write an automation for you and give it to you as something you can call, execute, then you in turn can build greater automation that incorporates the tool that I've made and you in turn can create more powerful tools that are then shared with others beyond that. Let me just throw something at the dog because he's going to bark. <laughs> there we go. Um, so this was, I understood this a while back and I was like, okay, now I really get it. Now I really get what we're doing here. So I said that adaptability is agility plus resilience. So it's the combination of two things. So let's talk just briefly about the resilience side of the equation. The joys of working from home. Resilience. There are, there are um, three key elements to resilience, I think. The first one is the stuff that we learn from the safety movement, the safety world. There's a whole new way of thinking in the safety world known as safety two, which has been very influential in the DevOps world. And you may or may not realize the influence that safety two has had in DevOps. But a lot, a lot of ideas come to us through people like Dr. Sidney Decker, who has become a keynote speaker in the, in the DevOps world. And this is OSH safety I'm talking about. This is aeronautical safety, medical safety. This, this new way of thinking in their world has been very influential on our world. Then a second big foundation to this is the um, resilience engineering. And Cherry and I were lucky enough to go to the first redeploy conference in the US, which um, J. Paul Reed and uh, Mary, forget her last name, uh, organizing, um, organized a couple of years ago uh, because resilience engineering is becoming such an important domain in its own right and the ability to create these highly resilient IT environments. And of course, the foundation to all of that is again, automation. So automation gives us velocity at, with quality, but it also gives us resilience. Finally, I think the other big seminal influence has been the thinking of anti-fragility and anti-fragile. The, the idea of anti-fragile has changed fundamentally how we think about systems as fundamentally as the idea of complexity did the, the again we could spend an hour on or we could spend hours couldn't we on anti-fragile but the the core to it is that systems are built in such a way that they don't collapse under stress they yield under stress and recover come back better than they were they thrive under stress they improve under stress that's an anti-fragile system if you've got a manual process and you screw up and you deploy 3000 web servers into production instead of three, I can send out as many emails and rewrite as many handbooks as I want to say, don't do the thing. Don't make that mistake. 
but what's the probability that you will make that, that somebody will make that mistake again in the future? The probability is, is one, right? <laughs> that they will do it again one day. Whereas if you've got an automated process and somebody deploys 3000 web servers into production instead of three, then we can put a check in the automation to make sure that they don't do that again. Every time there is a failure, we can improve the automation to eliminate that failure in future. Therefore, automated systems are anti-fragile in a way that manual systems are not. So when we look at, the, at these ideas of velocity and, and resilience and anti-fragility, automation is at least supporting us, if not delivering us all of these things. So what can we automate in IT? Well, um, this is a diagram talking about the value streams in that IT produces for the organization horizontally in order to support the primary customer value stream that the organization is delivering to our users. And we're contributing value into that value stream at a number of levels. Those of you who are familiar with IT for IT um, from the, the, what are they called? The open group, from the open group then uh, we'll recognize some of these value streams. And I've chucked a few others in there too, which I think are worthy of calling out as streams of value that we contribute into the organ we in IT contribute into the organizational value stream. And so DevOps primarily is interested in automating the require to deploy value stream. It has something to say about most of the others and some contribution to them, but primarily DevOps is about um, automating uh, that flow, that value stream. So if we talk about that, then stereotypically, it looks something like this from a business requirement, not from the act of writing requirements, but from a business requirement through to deploying uh, the service is the required to deploy value stream that IT for IT talks about. And within that value stream, there are some practices of DevOps that we talk about a lot in DevOps that contribute to the automation of that value stream. First of all, there's continuous integration, which is a developer discipline of integrating our work back into the master at least daily uh, at some sort of high frequency regularly integrating our work so that we don't have large-scale merges required whenever we want to deploy the code is is integrated at all at all times or some approximation thereof and then we have uh, continuous testing to automate as much as possible of the testing, again, to increase the quality and velocity of our work. We have continuous delivery, which is the mother of all practices, the, the, the almost an ideology rather than a practice the, the, that does everything we can to have the work as close to production deployable as possible at all times. That's what continuous delivery is, getting it as close to production deployable, as ready to deploy at the drop of a hat in the perfect world as we can possibly get it. And finally, and often overlooked, continuous monitoring. So the State of DevOps report a long time ago called out continuous monitoring as one of the top five predictors of a high performing IT organization. And so continuous monitoring is the automation of what we and we ITListers would call event management, the automation of monitoring the events in our environment and environments, not just production. You see, I've drawn it as a, a stretch bubble that goes right back to our development environments. You know, we should be continuously monitoring all of our environments, not just the production run, but the idea is that continuous monitoring gives us higher quality and most importantly, accelerated feedback to detect and respond to conditions. 
So those are the four primary practices that DevOps talks about, ways of working that give us DevOps within the required employee value stream. In terms of talking about um, automation, and I get in trouble for saying this sometimes, but tech's easy, right? The technology's the easy bit. If you're familiar with mathematical, the, philosoph the, the philosophical idea of open and closed problems, then a closed problem is one where you can prove there's a solution even if you haven't found it yet. And with the technological problems that we have with DevOps, they're always closed problems. You know there's a solution, you just need, you just need to find it. And with sufficient time and money, you can solve it. There's nothing that's unsolvable. Whereas the, 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 the human problems and the, the complex systemic problems are open problems. They, they may not be solvable. And so always, in my experience, the, you know, the, the technical stuff, you just need smart enough people with enough resources and they'll solve it that that's the, the that's a given it's the um it's the the human and cultural and systemic issues that are that are fun personally i don't focus a lot on the technology right i'm if we can find really really smart people then then um you know they'll solve that but the systemic stuff is much more challenging so if we look at the system of work, of how we're working in order to do these things, then I constantly find myself having to remind people that you can't change a cog in a machine. You know, you can't say, make the change management process faster, because the change management process is just one cog in a much more complex machine, and it can't be faster on its own. Having one cog spin faster doesn't achieve anything in a gearbox. So we need a holistic systems view, and we need to improve the performance of the system as a whole of the system of work in order to achieve the velocity and quality that we want to get agility. And DevOps knows this, you know, the, right from the early days, we've had this mantra, this acronym of CALMS, C-A-L-M-S or C-A-M-S or C-A-L-M-R or there is all sorts of variations on it because DevOps is whatever you say it is, but the, some of the core Illuminati of DevOps use the phrase C-A-L-M-S. So the DevOps, the primary concerns of DevOps are culture, automation, lean, measurement, and sharing. And so where does technology play a part in those? Automation, obviously, and to a lesser extent measurement, because that's not really what they mean by measurement. They mean be data driven. So really, you know, automation is only one part of that picture. And the rest of it is about culture and ways of working and human aspects. And that has always been how DevOps was understood. That DevOps is not a technology problem and DevOps is not about automation. Automation is again, a means to an end for DevOps, which is, uh, accelerated and high quality delivery of software. Then we hit the problem that everybody talks about DevOps transformations. We're having a DevOps project. We're going to do DevOps. Go and buy me one of them DevOps. We've got a vendor who's going to come and put DevOps in. And um, you've all seen that anti-pattern. Right? So we have this language of how do we achieve the transformation to DevOps? And so what is the main critical success factor in advancing to new ways of working and achieving that? Well, we first of all try and stop the language of transformation or even of implementation. We're going to implement it. We're going to have a project to do it because it's none of those things. It's a journey. DevOps is a way of improving how you work. And automation is one of its primary tools, but DevOps is a way of improving how you work. So just like Agile, which it's really a subset of, then um, it, there is no state. What day will we be DevOps? You can't define we are DevOps. 
there, there's no end state that is definable and you never will get to an end state. You will be continuously improving uh, in a DevOps way. DevOps is a way of improving. It's a journey. So it's forever. So we need to really kill that language of transformation and implementation and talk what the word we like is advancement. So in order to advance, there's this little sequence of uh, interconnected behaviors that this isn't a project plan. This isn't a sequence of steps. This is saying that this is a causal connection of, of behaviors or activities that if we change the principles and goals and values and of the system of work, that will change the way we manage that system of work, which will allow, or in fact, encourage the managers to change the conditions of the system of work. And that will allow the system of work to change, which will allow people to work differently, which will change their behavior, which will eventually emerge as a different culture. So but we've come to understand this causal chain that if you come in and you say, be DevOps, six months later, they won't be DevOps or they won't do DevOps. And you can buy all the DevOps you want and nothing's going to change because what you're trying to change is you're trying to change at the top there, change the work. And you can't just change the work because the system doesn't allow people to work differently. They're still funded the same way they were before. They're still measured and KPI the same way they were before. They're still, the organization still wants you to deliver software in quarterly or annual releases. And the, 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 the organization still does everything as a project and wants you to deliver naught or one, no project and the suddenly project or two or three steps major, but still major delivery steps. And your policies are zero risk policies and, and so, yada, 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 yada. So you're trying within an organizational system that doesn't allow new ways of working to attempt new ways of working. And so it's a formula for failure. I think it's important that if we understand this causal chain of how do we advance in a DevOps way or an agile way, or, you know, a lot of the other things we're trying to achieve these days with new ways of working, we need to understand that and we need to realize, certainly it's my experience over and over again, is that the bit that gets overlooked, the bit that so often fails to change is changing the conditions for the system. And that is the middle management. The middle management are the ones who set most of the conditions locally for how we work. So we say, and, and I, I'm being very abstract here, but if you can think of practical examples of this, I'm sure, where, uh, you know, there's, we want to achieve, uh, we want to achieve a cycle time of releasing software every week, but the regression testing takes five days of manual work. Or we want to achieve a cycle of, once every week or two weeks, but the cab meeting only meets once a week. And most of the things we try and do are still defined as normal change. Or we want to have standing teams who focus on being a product team for a specific piece of software over a long time, over a year or years as a stable standing team. But the money for it is coming in as big gobs of project funding. So how do we turn project funding into product team funding or um, the risk policies of the organization is, are all about minimization of risk and there's no understanding of um, different levels of risk for pace layered systems or the ability to increase risk for strategic business reasons or uh, there's all these inflexibilities where the old school thinking of the system doesn't allow new ways of working. And the primary custodians of changing those things are the middle managers. And so they are so often the blocker and they're the group that have the least focus I find in so many quote transformations that it's all about make the people be different. You know, what's wrong with them? Can you fix them? We're, we're management. We get it. 
you know, we're hit. We understand all these new ways of working. I don't think you do. And, and so that area doesn't get addressed adequately. This is, your mileage may vary, but this has been my personal observation that if this is the area that needs focus in order to give us a much better than 27% success rate for our attempts to do projects, to do transformations. And, and there's so, so there's a whole lot of basic principles and beliefs and ideology that we need to change around um, ways of management. So it's not about just new ways of working, but it's new ways of managing, which is Teal Unicorn's specialty area. That's our area as a team. And, and getting management to let go of the old command and control ideologies and understand servant leader behaviors and the empowerment of people to work in new ways is, is I think the key to the challenge. So we can summarize and say DevOps is about greater adaptability to a VUCA world through greater agility and resilience to give us that adaptability and with we are IT, our part in that overall thing is to deliver greater agility and resilience in IT through automation, primarily of the pipeline of software from development to production, which is not a technology problem. That's the easy bit of it all. It requires a holistic systems approach to culture, automation, lean measurement and sharing across the whole value stream which is enabled by changing how we manage the work as we think one of the key blockers and unlockers of that new ways of working. So there you go. That's Teal Unicorn's view of new ways of working, allowing us to achieve DevOps. of the I, the word consequences because okay. one of the big parts of getting to new ways of working mm -hmm. is moving to a culture of collaborate collaboration and equality and empowerment of people and so consequences to me has a negative stick rather than carrot kind of con there will be consequences if you do not achieve kind of thing yeah, if we want to make it clear to people that we're moving away from yeah uh command and control and and scientific management then i think if we can be careful not to use words that invoke in their minds an emotional response to that kind of yeah, yeah. uh theory x culture right and move more to a theory y behavior then yeah. Um, it's, it's important we don't trigger them like you trigger me by using these yeah. words that people have these historic negative baggage and associations. Yeah. We have to be very careful when we talk about DevOps because I've been, I've, I've been, literally been in the situation of being invited in to talk to someone about DevOps and discover that I'm talking about culture and automation and lean and, you know, and the, the whole change in the universe, right? And new ways of thinking, man. And they are there to talk about how do I automate some Linux servers? You know, there the, are the, these people are on very different planes when they talk about DevOps, I agree. And to some people, it really is just the tools to automate some servers, period. And to some people, it is just getting the Dev and Ops people to not hate each other, right? It, it, that's that's it and to some people it's just continuous delivery it's just the pipeline and the flow of work so um i've i've learned to drive myself back from trying to change the world with devops to just understanding that it is it is at least something to do with that required to deploy value stream getting software from development to production that that's devops it's about how do we make that work and work faster and work better and therefore one of the key obstacles is and always was getting the dev and the ops domains collaborating, the silos collaborating. 
So that's a key element to it. But I certainly use DevOps to mean that its primary objective, its primary outcome, which is faster and better work to production. I think training has value just to get people in a common language. So training and especially certification have a dirty connotation in the DevOps world, it's evil work of Satan, codifying DevOps. Uh, but I think it's useful to do training so that people have a common language and a common understanding of terms and, and you know, they're on the same page roughly, but beyond that, uh, you know, I don't think it's, it, it, it's going to really make people, it's, it's, you know, I mean, you can train someone to use a piece of software to a point where they're pretty good at using the piece of software, but you can't train someone to do new ways of thinking and working and behaving by a training course. It just doesn't do it. It's, I can give you a driver's license, but it doesn't make you a great career driver or a great, you know, bodyguard just because you need your driver's license, but it's just a very first step on the journey. So I think the key thing in these things to also get a plug in is don't try and do it alone. It's far more important than training is getting people in who know what the hell they're talking about to help you do it. It's the things that come from the, the stakeholders and particularly the owners of the organization as the guidelines that they set as governance to the organization to say, this is who we are and this is what we do and this is how we do it and this is why we do it. That's what I, I mean by the, the principles. It's the, it's the fundamentals that drive management, the fundamentals that set the guidelines and the bounds for what management will do. It's how, it's what we want management to achieve and how we want them to achieve it. It's possible for failure to destroy an organization. And it is never possible to have, it's, it's never possible to have zero risk of that happening. So management can always potentially fail in such a way that they destroy the organization. We can't eliminate that possibility or even a humble employee, a sysprog like Knight Capital and is the one that everyone talks about in the UK where they took the whole multi-billion dollar organization out by just putting, missing out one server and a list of servers in an automated script, wiped out the organization. So, um, we, we have to be careful to just accept the fact that, that we want to minimize failure, but we can't have zero failure and we can't create consequences in any way that will ever eliminate that possibility. It's always going to happen. It's like that guy in Hawaii who issued the nuclear alert to the whole state of Hawaii. Oh yeah. And, yeah. and initially the authorities stood by him and said, we will make mistakes. He was tired. It was change of shift. It was just a drop down, you click the wrong option and you've just alerted, the, you know, and they stood by him and the media pack just bayed for days until eventually they relented and fired him. Mm. And that's, and I can see Robert Dimbrada agreeing there, right? That's a terrible consequence, isn't it? That's very much the wrong, I understand your language too, very much the wrong behavioral reinforcement to do that kind of thing. Absolutely. I heard, I heard recently a wonderful story of um, a new CIO and, and a sysprog did the thing, screwed it up. They're having the post incident review. Everyone's sitting around very quiet because the, the guy's in the room with them and he's looking very quiet and staring at the floor because he knows how this is going to go. And everyone's feeling bad for him because they like him. And there's this sort of uncomfortable silence while they're waiting to start. And the door opens and a new CIO walks in who was not scheduled to be at the incident review. And they're like, oh dear. And he walks over to the guy and he says, I've just come to apologize on behalf of the organization for ever putting you in a situation where you were working stressed and tired at 3 a.m. and made a mistake like this. And I want everybody to understand the objective of this post-incident review is to figure out how we don't ever do that to anyone again. And walked out. And I thought, yeah, that's, that's leadership. Friendship. That is really good leadership. <laughs> So I, going to my, that slide where I said, how do we achieve this kind of transformation slash don't call it that, call it advancement. How do we achieve this kind of advancement? 
then I'm very passionate about moving towards a new culture that is that kind of thinking. So I think that's key to how do we move forward in any sort of changing how we work. Specifically to DevOps, absolutely you can do DevOps in a command and control culture. It's just going to getting people to adopt it, moving towards that change is going to be difficult. It's going to be retarded by that. I just, just as people say, oh, you need to be doing agile development in order to do DevOps. And I say, no, you don't. You can do DevOps in a really horrible old waterfall mainframe COBOL. No, actually, I shouldn't say that because they're some of the most DevOpsy people around. But, you know, in a really old school, horrible um, three month cycle, clunky development world, you can still accelerate getting it to production at a higher quality. It's much harder to do DevOps in a non agile world, but it's not a given that it has to be. And so in the same way, these groovy new cultures, it's not a given that we need these cultures to be DevOps. It just makes it a lot easier to get there. So in some ways, nothing, but what has changed, some things have changed. So for the, you know, Wayne and I go back 30 years and, and many of you look as gray as me. You know, people say, oh, this is just, we've gone full circle. We used to do this in the sixties when we threw the tape over the partition, you know, it's, you know, nothing's changed. And in a sense, that's true. We've gone back to being tight, collaborative, all working in one area and, you know, on one machine and, but other things. So it's really, it's not a circle though. If you look at it differently, it's a spiral. So other things have changed. And so one of the things that's changed is the insane complex complicatedness of what we're trying to manage now. So the number of items that we are managing is just far more com complicated than it ever was. The network is much busier, much, much busier than what we're trying to manage. So the scale of that is, is really challenging. And Internet of Things is just going to take that several orders of magnitude further again. It's just going to get nuts. So I remember 20 years ago, working with Unicenter technology, CA Unicenter, the systems management tool. And at ANZ Bank, we broke the tool because they tried to manage more than half a million objects. And the tool had never been designed to manage more than half a million objects. You know, so that was the exponential curve coming up that, that the numbers were just expanding faster than the thinking was. So that's one thing that is very different is, is, is the number of things we're dealing with. Um, I think our understanding of complexity and particularly this concept of anti-fragile is quite new. So designing systems with anti-fragility in mind, I think is actually a bit of a step change in thinking. Um, I think that is a concept that didn't really, was never really called out or codified until Nick Taleb did. You, you're more of a philosopher than I am, Robert, but um, I think that's true. Um, and then the other thing that is new is the automation tools. The power of what we can automate really quickly and really easily is just going up by orders of magnitude. And I, you know, I hate I'm AI and machine learning and so but machine learning really is starting to contribute to that domain to make things possible that really weren't possible 20, 30 years ago in terms of automating. I think the automation, the tools are just so cool. Yeah. Going back to that diagram I had of the, um, of, of the, the Kinefin thing that as you, um, that AI really only works in that defined and repeatable area. It, it, I think it's growing, but it's still an idiot machine, right? It still has no real, it's not artificial intelligence. It's, it's just machine learning. There's no intelligence in there that wasn't put in there by a human. But, it, but we're starting, I can see the future. I can see that it potentially it could get smart enough to move out of that clear domain in Kinefin, at least into the complicated and start behaving like an expert. And maybe even one day get to the point of being able to do what humans do in the other domains, but it's a long way away. I agree. And really it only 
functions that top area. But there's another thing in that diagram, if I could master the technology to get us back there, which is, which is that the world has this nasty habit of continually changing on us so that, um, so that as fast as we get work up into the complicated and clear, there's this like this headwind blowing at us of change in the world, VUCA, that is bringing up new scenarios and changing the current conditions all the time. So we keep getting blown back down into chaotic and complex. And so I did that book that's up behind Cherry, Stand Up Plus Case, and a lot of years ago, which is really a simple, I understand now, is actually a simplified sense making tool that just says the world is either standard or it's a case. It's a, it's a you know, like a police case or a medical case. It's something we have to unpack. And, and so as fast as we push the world up into clear, things happen that keep hurling at least bits of the work down into chaotic or into complex. So I agree with you. Unfortunately, as fast as we standardize it, unstandardize this again. And this new stuff that we can't automate until, as you say, we work it back up that tree and we get the entropy out of it and we control it and constrain it and understand it, define it. One of the reasons that DevOps is so important is because that chain of getting software from development to production, that particular chain of work is highly automatable. It's one particular context that's very tractable to automation. We can make it very repeatable and like when you were saying that these things that fall outside, you can, if you think about people who are automating deployment with DevOps, it's very rare that something comes along that they have to drop outside that automated process to get it to production. They can get almost all their work standardized and put it into the machine. It has very high levels of, it's easy to get very, you know, very high coverage with automation of that particular task, that particular flow of work. It's very amenable. And that's why P DevOps is successful for people because that's the bit they work on, making that fast and high quality. And, 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 and not just that bit, actually, the environment, th no, that's not right. That flow and all the underpinning infrastructure we have to do to make that possible. Right. So like Wayne, oh, he's dropped off. That's right. But Wayne was talking about automating the spinning up of um, Kix environments on mainframes, CICS environments on mainframes, which means nothing to half the people on this call. The, the, but the idea of being able to deploy a, a, a whole production environment um, with web servers and app servers and databases and security profiles and standing up infrastructure as code, putting out a whole infrastructure automated in order that we can flow that software through on top of it. That's all very amenable to automation. IT is a very tractable environment for standardization and automation compared to medicine. 